So my name's Jolyon Rubinstein. Uh, I don't actually work for the BBC. Um, I'm a, a satirist. I make a, a show, or I did make a show for three series on the BBC called The Revolution Will Be Televised, which won a BAFTA. But before that, I was making content online. And um, I suppose my perspective uh, as, a, as a sort of proud member of the Sheffield uh, Documentary uh, Festival's advisory board is that we're really entering a new period of time, a period of time where quite possibly content creators know far more than uh, traditional content makers and commissioners about the best ways to attract very large audiences in a digital age because finding a large audience is probably as scary and as difficult for a commissioner as working out how to use that cool font on Snapchat. <laughs> Completely eludes them. Um, so we've got a very illustrious and fantastic um, who I will now introduce. Um, so we have um, to my right Dan Jones, who's the director of content at the uh, digital media giant Little Dot Studios and exec to produce the very successful BBC Three documentary Rise of the Superstar Vloggers. Um, with a background in docs and uh, a champion of all things social and digital, Dan is at a forefront uh, of bridging the gap between traditional docs and the new media. How are you doing, Dan? Very well. How's the hangover? Uh, well, I only arrived this morning, so I'm fine. <laughs> Boring. Lies. Uh, so can we see a little clip now of that fantastic documentary? So to my right uh, is the wonderful uh, Hannah Witten, who is a young vlogger who talks about all things sex. Uh, she began to make videos while studying for a degree in sexual history at the University of Birmingham, and her channel has grown exponentially since then, um, becoming a popular name and a familiar face in the worlds of YouTube, uh, sex talks and feminism. Her sex positive work has been recognized by both MTV and Durex. Uh, she's a member of the global crew for uh, the Someone Like Me campaign, which promotes healthy sex education. And in 2013, uh, was shortlisted for Young Person of the Year uh, for the Sexual Health Awards in partnership with uh, Brooke and the FPA. In 2014, uh, she was shortlisted for Blessed Vlog at the Cosmopolitan Blog Awards. And her short film on the history of homosexuality was a finalist in the Guardian at Oxford University's Press very short film competition in 2013. Um, her provocative video titles bring in viewers whilst her intuitive and engaging content keeps them coming back for more. Um, if anyone has seen her in drunk in conversation with people uh, on her channel, it's, uh, it's hysterical and, and quite, you know, quite sort of unusual. How are you doing? I'm good. Who and wrote you, that? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Me. All of it. See, that's the kind of warmth you get at Sheffield. It doesn't come on. Everyone's waiting. And you still get a rousing load of applause. And well done, the tech guys. We're there. <laughs> So to my left is uh, Jonathan Sarcone Jolly. Uh, Jonathan is the dad of one of YouTube's most popular vlogging families, the Sarcone Jollies. Uh, Jonathan and his wife Anna have been filming their children, Amelia and Eduardo, literally since the moment of their births. Uh, their daily videos are viewed by 1.5 million subscribers and showcase the realities of their family life, from cooking to shopping, bathing and eating, and loyal fans follow literally every move and some younger viewers have even written fan fiction and asked to be adopted by the family. Um, uh, so, you know, the question is, is this the new form of reality TV? So, Johnny, how are you doing? Cool. I'm good. And you've also come up here today. We right? have come up here from sunny yeah. London. It's good. This is quite rare for Sheffield, not hang a hungover panel. <laughs> so, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm very pleased. So, can we see the uh, clip from Johnny's show, real, please? Very good. Um, so, to my left, we have, oh, sorry, to my right, I have the uh, magnificent, magnificent Samantha Montgomery, a.k.a. Princess Shaw, uh, with the str definitely the strongest look on the panel, without any shadow of a doubt. Um, Samantha uh, loves to sing. Her passion is her songs, uh, which she uploaded to YouTube, as well as performing in bars and clubs in her native uh, New Orleans. Her audience, however, 
uh, was relatively small before a music producer from Israel, uh, Koitman, came across her song and decided he wanted to mix it. Um, Koopman's friend, Ido Ha, uh, contacted Princess Shaw, telling her he was going to make a documentary about the lives of YouTubers. The documentary follows the life of uh, Princess Shaw from unknown YouTuber to internet sensation, uh, following her inclusion in one of Koopman's videos. Um, and since then, uh, she's traveled the world promoting the documentary, uh, which is generally quite extraordinary. Can we see the trailer for the film, please? That's great, and you can see uh, that movie at the festival uh, this year. Um, so to my far left is uh, Johnny Benjamin, who's a mental health campaigner, blogging, uh, uh, blogger sorry, and a film producer, directly linked with the world of vlogging and docs. Um, he began vlogging as a way to deal with his mental health issues, and his suicide survival story was uh, a subject of the documentary Stranger on the Bridge, which I've seen, and he's one of, it's an incredibly powerful film. I would recommend anyone to have a look at it. Um, he now works as a producer for uh, Postcard Productions, uh, the company that made the documentary, uh, at the same time as vlogging and running workshops on vlogging as a way to deal with mental health recovery issues. Um, so can we now have a look at uh, the clip um, of some of Johnny's work? Very powerful stuff. Um, so, as you can see, we've got an incredibly diverse panel um, from issues of mental health, family life in the digital age, uh, sex, um, music, and uh, producers of content who move between all things. Um, it's funny because as someone who actually started out on YouTube, when I first started seeing vlogging, um, I just didn't get it. I just didn't, I found it quite hard to, to, to get, which is scary for people who I think grew up with the internet. Um, and it's taken a long time for me to get on board, but I think, as you can see, it's a very different form. So we're gonna start, we're gonna go uh, across the panel and thank you all for sharing your very you know, personal, uh, if incredibly different, diverse stories. So Dan, you've worked with um, an awful lot of vloggers and how would you, what is vlogging um, and how, if at all, does it compare um, to making television? So being a sort of teleproducer for years and then last I don't know, six or seven years working with vloggers quite a lot, what I started to see was this real split, and this is what encouraged me to want to try and put the documentary together, a real split of very, very loosely under 25s and over 25s of how people viewed um, vloggers and how they connected with it and their understanding of um, vlogging in its different forms. And I think over 25s just, and it's really, really loose in terms of how I'm splitting it, but over 25s just didn't get it and thought of it as this sort of narcissistic, talking about yourself, down on camera lens, um, really easy to put together, no sort of thought process or edit process, no effort to making millionaires every day. And then under 25s, uh, probably weren't watching a lot of TV, but were completely uh, responding to the way that vlogging worked. And I sort of wanted to tell a bit of a story in the documentary of why that is and address exactly those sort of questions. And I think there's, for me, there's a the real difference of TV being a um, sort of lean back um, medium where you sort of sit and consume it and vlogging being a bit more of a, a connection platform. It's a bit of a two-way conversation. And I think the, the examples I had there are perfect examples of uh, why vlogging connects with, connects with so many young people who aren't really connecting with TV in, in quite the same ways. So some of it is just entertainment and, and so on, and I think but some of it is uh, connecting on a mental health level or sex education level or just following people's stories. It feels really, really different. So the first half of the documentary made was telling uh, that sort of story of how does YouTube uh, work, how does vlogging work, how does anyone make money, what's the actual process that goes into this. But then we started to spend a bit more time and get into get, uh, sort of uh, under the skin of particular vloggers, and, and Johnny very kindly gave up his time to, to be part of that, um, to talk about what motivated um, vloggers. And I think a lot of that was, uh, a lot of their success came from they're just like us, and young people could really, really relate to, to the highs and the lows of what they were sharing on screen, because they were just sharing everything, and it was super honest, and sort of really connecting with that, that audience. And I think that for me, that's why Vlogging is quite 
different, even the, the sort of aesthetic of it, of you know, watching Johnny like that is just so powerful, mm. uh, even compared to a structured documentary about mental health, for, for example. And then in the documentary, we then got into sort of interesting questions of if you start vlogging, as a, for example, as a recover vlogger, um, or you start it because you are quite anxious at home or you're, you're, um, you haven't got as many friends in the sort of real world, so you're starting to talk to people um, through a camera lens, what does that actually mean when you start to have a million or, or 10,000 or a million or 10 million people suddenly interested in your every move when you come from a, a background of being probably quite insular and, and just feeling comfortable talking to a camera lens. So it's, so it's a really sort of interesting process to, to go through that um, and to hear from vloggers themselves who, what I quite liked about the process was vloggers talk um, to camera sort of, uh, you know, potentially 10 minutes every day in terms of material that, that goes out, put a huge amount of effort into it. And you feel like you sort of know everything about them. But actually, once we put a slight TV construct around it and had um, a telly team thinking about the sort of questions we would ask, and we used a vlogger, um, Jim Chapman, as a sort of conduit for that, who was really sort of inquisitive and has been vlogging for, for years, to ask those sort of questions about what does it mean to, to be a vlogger. Um, again, we really got under the surface of what's the motivation, um, that sort of thing. But a lot of the we interviewed some of the biggest vloggers in the world and all of them said, I've never thought about that. No yeah. one's ever asked me why I do this mm. or why I actually got started and what motivated me to do it. And we've got some really, really interesting responses from that. But I think all of it comes back down to that um, sort of honest portrayal of your, yourself that is sort of relatively unedited, putting it out there to the world and people really, really responding to that. Um, Princess Shaw. You are, you know, someone who's, who's done that with your own musical form. What is vlogging and how did you decide that you wanted to start uh, the process of, of vlogging yourself? Well, vlog, I'm close to down the what to the microphone, okay. <laughs> well, vlogging is just like, I guess, a daily, like, diary of your life, I guess. Every day you do it. Like, some people do it, I don't do it every day. But it's like a chance to see deeper into a person's life every day. And I started doing, like, sometimes I do vlogs and I do singing videos, but I started to do it because I wanted to take people on a journey through the process of me going from, you know, being just a YouTuber to this viral person to this traveling the world. So I wanted to take people with me on the journey. And I think that's what, like, vlogging is. You're taking people with you, do everything in your life, your journey. And so that's why I started doing vlogging. Mm. And, I mean, you have quite a unique sort of... Um sort of story in a way for, for people in the audience who maybe don't understand what remix kind of culture is online and exactly what sort of with your particular uh, song can you just explain to them what that sort of means and, and, and you know how that works with you and your music um, wait, what? well you had a, a producer didn't you in Israel well, see your like, well yeah a producer from Israel saw my video and um, took my song and just like put me into this musical arrangement he already had so yeah, is that what you talk about? Yeah, yeah. She's literally got off a plane <laughs> earlier from New Orleans. <laughs> it's really incredible. Sorry, so. Uh, so hold on. So Hannah, yeah. you, 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 are, you know, you, your blogs are very, very personal, um, uh, and uh, you talk about some stuff that maybe for sort of my generation and maybe for older generations was quite, quite taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about um, sort of um, sort of personal sexual experience, talking about. Um, things like slut shaming or, or sort of other terms that sort of are, are a bit to do. How did you get into vlogging? What is vlogging? Um, you know, tell us a bit about you know what you do. Um, well, first of all, I wouldn't. I kind of wouldn't say that mine are personal. Mm. Like I think that I, with the content that's about sex and relationships, I will draw on personal experiences or my friends' experiences. But like, I definitely like every YouTuber is different in terms of like the boundary that mm. they set between like what they show publicly and what their private life is. Like everyone will have a, a different line that they draw and I'm always quite strict with my line. Like my audience don't know about like my personal love life or my personal sex life. Like that I don't really talk about. Um, it's always more like talking about sex and relationships and um, like body image and stuff more in like the abstract. Um, or, con or like conceptualizing it, I don't know. Um, but like 
why I started um, was I started making videos about five years ago and it was initially out of boredom um, because, yeah, I just didn't have a lot to do. I was living in a different country and I didn't know that many people there, so kind of like exactly what you're saying about having no friends, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Um, and then like just finding this community online, like I watched um, videos for like a while before I decided I wanted to start making them, but it was the, the community online that like really drew me to wanting to make videos. I was like, oh, these people are friends and it looks like so much fun. Um, yeah, and so then I started making videos and then um, it was maybe like a few months later, I'd kind of like started to gain a bit uh, of an audience, like quite a small audience, but um, you can see in like the back analytics of YouTube, like the demographics of your audience. And I saw that most of mine were like young women. Um, and I was already interested in sex education like before I started making YouTube videos. Um, and I also watched a lot of Lacey Green, who is a big sex ed vlogger in the States. And so then that, like, seeing that my audience kind of were my age and, like, people that I wanted to, like, give back to and help. Um, and then with the, inf like, inspiration of Lacey and stuff, I was like, I'm gonna make videos about sex. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, it's interesting just hearing you say that some of the things you don't think are personal in, in some of your videos, um, you've, uh, for instance, sort of like talked to an ex-boyfriend about oh, yeah, sort of your relationship with, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean that this, yeah. But it's interesting that you don't even find that as personal yeah, because I think that was, for people of maybe yeah. my, my mother's generation, yeah. they'd be just horrified that that even wasn't personal. That, that video is definitely like me stretching right. my, like my personal boundaries because I remember, I, I remember filming that and after we finished um, filming it, um, I, I said, I was like, well, who knows if that's ever going to go online, ever. Um, and I like, still like, wasn't sure if I would ever put it up until like, I edited it together. And I was like, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's very entertaining. Yeah. Um, so, Johnny, um, you, your, your sort of vlogging is, is sort of a rather different sort of tone, sort of quite feel good as well. Um, so what is vlogging for you um, and how did you get into it? Yeah, so uh, I, I started vlogging, I started making animation on YouTube and it would take me like months and months to work on like really small 3D animation and no one cared. No one left comments, no one left likes and I'd be like, I've spent so much time, this is so cool. And then one day, six years ago, I was like walking my dog up a mountain and I decided to just like video it. It wasn't, vlogging wasn't really a defined thing. And I was like, okay, I'll just video it. And then everyone was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, so I went to university for four years for nothing? <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought, like, um, what if I, like, you know, sort of filmed more sort of, like, life things, not, like, not exciting things, just, like, more, like, just living your life. And then I said I would do it for, like, seven days. And then I did it for seven days. And I think, like, a few hundred people watched. That was a lot, mm. you know, a long time ago. And I was like, okay, well, let me do it for a month. And I was, I was hooked, addicted, mm. you know. And it's like an instant gratification of people, like, acknowledging you exist in this world. And it was just like, wow, this is amazing. And then we just, we just kept it up, you know. Mm. And, and in that time... I didn't, I didn't realize that I was going to capture over the last six years of my life, uh, you know, moving in with my girlfriend, getting engaged, um, getting, getting married, then saying we're never having children, and then having children, and then some handing up at six dogs, and then having another child, and then moving to the UK. And it is cool to like have all that captured, you know, to remember stuff, mm. you know, the forgotten. You know, you can't, I do totally forget though that people are watching. Mm. You know, you, you, don't, you don't really think, like, I don't think, like, oh, there's a million and a half people here. I just see it as, like, just, I'm talking to myself, mm. you know? I mean, your, I suppose your content, where it may differ from some of the other people on the panel, is almost like you've got, like, a cast, almost like the Kardashians. Yeah. You know, it's so like you, your daughters and your wife. Um, is that kind of like round meal time? So you sort of discuss what you're going to do the next day or stuff? Or is it, you know? Not really. I think if I ever structured the videos, it wouldn't work. You know, I try and keep them as organic as possible. Obviously, you know, it's been six years. I haven't missed a day. You know, it goes up at six o'clock every single day. It is formatted to 60 minutes. I have found a sort of a perfect formula that people kind of enjoy. And so, you know, I do think about it when I'm doing it, but I would never let it affect my life. You know, I have to just live my life the way I want to live it and then just sort of try to film it, not let the filming define my life. Mm, sure. 
Sure. Um, so, Johnny, um, you know, obviously, again, uh, a very different um, uh, sort of, sort of quite, quite a cathartic experience to an extent, quite a sort of, you know, deeply personal um, uh, and moving um, experience to, to, to watch. And um, how, how did you get into vlogging? What was the sort of thinking and, and sort of, I suppose, what is vlogging for, for the lay person? Yeah, so um, when I was 20, uh, I was diagnosed with a form of schizophrenia. And um, for the first few years, I just really struggled. And because uh, I wasn't talking, you know, mental health, mental illness comes with such a stigma. And I was so embarrassed and I was so ashamed of, of you know, my illness. And I didn't, I didn't talk about it to anyone. And then um, a few years uh, after my diagnosis, a family friend of ours had a, had a massive heart attack. And I went to see him in the hospital and we spoke for ages. He told me everything he'd gone through, like the physical symptoms of, of the heart attack, but also the emotional. He got very emotional, the emotional side of it. And I sat there listening, why, thinking, why can he talk so openly about his physical health? And I just, I cannot talk about my mental health. And I was like, this has got to change. And I went home from the hospital and I just took my camera phone out and I was like, I just, I need an outlet now. I need an outlet, I need to talk. And I just put, turned the record button on and all this stuff just came out, you know. All the stuff I've been keeping inside just all came out. So it was an outlet, but it was also, um, I didn't know anyone at that time with a mental health issue and I wanted to connect to people. I knew I wasn't alone because it's so isolating. Uh, anyone that's experienced mental illness will know it's so isolating. And so I wanted to connect with others and uh, so I put this YouTube video out there to, to try and you know, connect with people and I was amazed at the amount of people that got in touch to say, you know, oh, I, I've got schizophrenia, I've got depression, you know, I've been suicidal as well and it's such a relief to know that you're not alone. It's, it's, it's just a weight off, off, off your shoulders really. And so I've been video blogging, um, vlogging since, since then really and I'm more honest in my vlogs than I am with anyone, because it's hard to look someone in the eyes and you know uh, speak about really personal stuff, and it's just easier. I know it's going out to an audience, but it's just easier for me. There's no judgment there. It's it's just you just talk, and it's just it's it's a great outlet. So, and lots of people that I work with, a lot of people that have have mental health issues, and when you go on that sort of journey, and you get through it, you you want to document it. You, people want to write blogs. People want to do vlogs, and so I do this this vlogging workshop to to encourage people and help people kind of support them to to start vlogging, because it's such a powerful tool, I think. And it's, it's been a part of my recovery. I'd say it's been a part of my recovery. You know, I wouldn't be so open, I wouldn't be sitting here being so open about my mental health if it wasn't for doing that vlogging. It's, it's built my confidence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something that um, I actually, I suppose, first got from watching Dan's documentary and something I'd like to ask you all about is um, what I think seems to be, for the lay person, quite a barrier to entry is not really understanding how much of a just pane of glass there is between a vlogger and their audience and the reactivity of a two-way conversation. So do you want to all talk in your own individual ways about how that conversation with your audience has changed what you're doing or affected it? Do you want to start? Kind of like you're saying? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I mean, my audience is just incredible. They've come on, they've come on the whole journey with me, like you, the, those recover logs. That was a, a year and a half ago, and I went through a relapse in my mental health, and I, I did this recover log series. Um, and every single video I put up, it was like so much support and love, and it was it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. Um, and I mean, I'm very lucky. I've got supportive friends and family, but people on YouTube that watch, watch my stuff, they've gone through it as well, and and, and they have an more of an understanding of it. And um, to have that, I mean. It's, it's like, you said community, did, did you say? yeah, it's like, a, it is a community, like a, like a mental health community. And um, some of them have been watching my videos since day one and, and that's been six years ago and they've come on that and it's just, it's phenomenal. And um, uh, the vlogs, you know, I, I know that they've, they've, some people have watched them and said, you know, I've gone and got help or um, in some cases it stopped them from, from taking their own lives. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it can be a really powerful tool and it's, it's, yeah, it's important to, to uh, connect to the audience and to um, I try and respond to them as well. You know, often people, there was one guy actually that messaged me, he was in New York and he said, uh, I'm about to jump out of my apartment block and can you call me on my cell phone? And, um, you know, it's, it's tough. You get, you get some tough, really kind of, they, they, yeah. they open up to you and, and, and you, so that can be tough, that can be tough. But at the same time, you know, you, you've, I feel a responsibility, I feel... Um, Did you call him? 
Uh, I didn't, and it's going to sound really bad, but... Um, no, I don't think it sounds bad at all. I mean, is there a line... That there is. There, there has to be, because, you know, I when, at the beginning, um, there was someone that had serious mental health issues, and I gave her my number, and she um, sort of bombarded me, and she said, I'm coming to live with you, and, mm. and I kind of learned early on, you know. And, and I work with a lot of mental health charities, and they say, you know, signpost, just signpost people to, to where to go. So I signposted him to the nearest places in New York, um, the, the nearest kind of uh, Samaritan Center and yeah. A&E and all of that sort of stuff. That's, that's, that's what I've been told to, to do. But you have, yeah, that connection with the audience is, is so important and, and can really make a difference to both you and, and them as well. Hannah, with your audience, what has been sort of, you know, what is the sort of relationship you have with the feedback? Do you, do you change your films? I think for, for a lot of traditional television producers, that idea is like the biggest nightmare of all time. It's like having feedback from a commissioning editor is bad enough, but if all your audience fed back to adapt to your show, uh, you know, it, it would, it would, the process would just fail. What, what's been your experience of it? Um, my experience has been mostly positive. Um, like, I really love my audience and the community that I've built around my videos. Um, but again, like with, with the nature of the content that I'm making, like talking about feminism and stuff, there are just, there's so many trolls out there. Um, but I am looking in that, like, it's only really ever if a video kind of blows up a bit outside of my usual viewing internet bubble that those horrible people will come. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, no, my viewers, um, they're, just, they're, they're just like me. Like, my, the demographic of my... Um, like my main viewership now is like 18 to 24 year old women living in the UK and I'm like oh I'm one of those um, <laughs> so so yeah, I like that I'm making content for people who you know are like my peers and um, I make videos like recommending books and films and TV shows and then like in the comments they're like oh my god have you checked this out have you checked this out and usually the things that they're telling me to check out I'm like I love it mm, this is great yeah. um, but then also with kind of like the the videos that are kind of about like um, like sex and relationships and I do stuff and like relationship abuse and LGBT stuff, um, the comments really come like a very vibrant place for discussion and support. Um, people looking to other people for advice, um, and it's just yeah, it's just a really lovely and like welcoming environment I think. And even just like on my way here, I don't know what it is about Sheffield, but just like walking here. Um, I bumped into two viewers who just like came up and said hello and like had a little chat with them and like um, one of them said she was like um, looking around Sheffield Hallam University nice. and stuff. So it's like, it's just a really, um, yeah, really nice relationship, good vibes. Yeah. yeah. Johnny, you have, um, you know, you have, a, you have a huge audience, you have over one million subscribers. Um, what's been your relationship with the sort of, you know, the feedback between <laughs> comments and sort of the way you do a traditional kind of I think it's kind of a mix, like what you were saying, like I do feel that like they are, I am like expressing things instead of holding them in all day long. So I am narrating my own life. So you know when you're going through life and you're trying to make decisions to do things, it is kind of cool to be able to like talk to so many people and then try and filter through the results that you get. As if like, oh, that was a terrible mistake. You know, and then I think it is cool to be able to like express things, but then in the same turnover, it's like when we meet viewers all the time, um, it surprises me the amount of people that come up and they hug me and to them I'm, I'm their dad or I'm their brother mm. or I've been there during a breakup or a relationship or a death or a problem in their life and they've just turned, they've gone into their room and they've just turned on my videos and it's just me being silly with my family but still it means something to people, it engages and they feel like I'm part of their life. And I think when I, when I grew up, um, you know, I, I had a, I, it was kind of tough growing up but I didn't have YouTube to lean into. You know, I just had like whoever was on my road, you know, and YouTube allows me to talk to the entire world and to reach people that I would never have been able to reach before. And when they meet you and they cry and they express that and you just feel like, whoa, I'm like, I thought I was just like some idiot making videos, but now I'm, I'm so important in people's lives, mm. you know, and it, it's, it is kind of hard because you feel like, but I'm still just an idiot. I'm still just a <laughs> normal person making these videos. I don't have a big production company, you know, there's, there's millions of viewers watching, but there's no, you know, directors and producers and regulators and people telling me. So sometimes I say stupid things and sometimes I make stupid remarks or whatever, but it's because I'm just a normal person. Maybe that's why people like vloggers, because they're real. 
You know, they're not, it's not scripted reality, it's real reality. It's not pretty all the time, it's not exciting all the time, but it's, it's really real, you know? It's like you were saying that you're the same age as your demographics, you're doing the same things. I'm not the same age as my demographic, <laughs> but we are kind of doing the same thing sometimes because we're all living very similar lives. They're just very What different. is your demographic, then? Oh, I have a very unique demographic. Ours is actually um, you know, sort of 18 to 35 would be our most popular. And then sort of there's a mix between the 13 to 17 and the sort of like 40s and onwards. Mm -hmm. Because we do a lot, a lot of viewers would be, um, let's say uh, someone's watching it, a teenager might watch the show, the parents are like, what the hell are you watching? Mm -hmm. You know, and then suddenly the mom's hooked and then she <laughs> sells it to the dad and then <laughs> boom, we got the family. You know, and we put it on at six o'clock every day and we hear a lot of uh, families come together to watch the show, you know, because they feel like there's something in it Maybe for everybody? Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd argue with all the people on the panel, you're more making a constructed reality sort of format. Like you said, it's a sort of a family show. And as such, uh, you know, you have other participants, you know, your daughters, for instance. And in a television context, there is more regulation about the time that's spent. And I know you've been, you know, you've experienced, in, uh, um, you know, some controversy with, you know, a lot of trolls and people who come in and, you know, talked about the amount your daughters are, are working on camera. Let's talk about that a little. Do you think that the vlogging space needs more regulation for things like child hours? And so yeah, there's more yeah, of Yeah, definitely. You know, I think everyone wants to villainize. Is that a word? Yeah. Yeah. Villainize people because they don't, they don't see me six years ago when, you know, I couldn't pay rent and I was just living with my girlfriend, graduated in like the worst recession to, as an animator, there's no jobs. Mm. They don't want to see that guy. They just want to turn on now and go like, oh, mm. uh, he, he's a bad, he must mm. be a bad person, sure. you know? And it, it's not, and reality is like, my wife and my kids are more important to me than making YouTube videos, you know? But you don't, you don't see, you, I, think, I guess you see what you want to see. And I think more regulation, like with the, when the ASA started to regulate, I thought that was brilliant. Do you want to explain what the ASA is to people who might not know? Advertising Standard Association. So when vloggers do brand deals, we now have to disclose any commercial relationships. And I think it's good and I think it's healthy to be able to say that, like, you know, if I'm working with a brand that, you know, I'm, I'm being honest and say, yeah, look, I'm being paid by, well, I'm not getting paid. By Shepherd Office. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like if I was, I just disclaimed that I'm, this, was, this is a commercial relationship because I do have a very powerful influence mm. over young viewers. I can influence them to do things, you know, to buy products. So, you know, by regulating the space, what it does also, it brings that this space becomes more, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be around here for much longer. Mm. You know, if it stays unregulated, it's like, it's cowboy land. You know, well, it's, 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 it's completely unregulated in the States. Yeah, that's so terrible. It's, it's, it's horrible, yeah. like, the amount of like, sponsored videos that I see. And you and know that, when you see them. And I know it's sponsored, and then, like, but their young audience watching it have no idea. And then yeah. You're like, Dad, I'm putting my hand up, you put yeah. your hand up. Yeah, come mm. on. Princess <laughs> um, Shaw, for you, like, what's been the kind of nature of the kind of relationship you've developed with your audience and the sort of, you know, the tenor of that? And you know, what's, um, what's it been like? It's been pretty good been a lot of good feedback but you know the vultures will circle eventually mm. you know it's like like he was saying like you know people only see certain parts of your life like mm. they may have started just watching you and don't know you're this kind of person but then they go backwards so they think you're only this kind of person they see you this way but like i think um like my channel is mostly about like it's most it's music and it's me talking about like like you know depression and I was going through a depression state, I was going through loneliness, I had this whole thing going on, and I just was like talking to my phone. And I didn't think beyond the phone because I'm just like, I don't know, I don't think like that, I guess. So I just like push publish. But I think it, it opens your world up to like different people, different places, um, and it connects people. And then it lets you know that, you know, you're not alone in this world. You're not going through this alone, you know, you're somebody else out there is going through the same thing. And I think it helps. A lot of people say that I inspire them. Me, my situation I went through, I inspire them. I think people, I think like the people, I don't really know like how old the people are that watch my videos or anything, because I just started really going up a little bit. I was like at 83 as y'all saw. I've started going up a little bit, but I kind of think it just like, it makes people know it's okay to, to be who you are and feel the way you feel because somebody out there is, you understand what I mean? It's like just being yourself mm. and just open. And you, when you're talking to them, when you when you bear your, you bearing your soul, 
And like he buried his soul on, on you, you know, your, your videos. And like he's like talking, he's showing his family, he's showing his life. And it's like people are burying their soul. And it's like it lets you know that it's okay to do that at some point. Mm. So, yeah. Dan, you've worked with huge amounts of bloggers. And I guess there is a big difference between uh, an unbelievably um, emotionally raw relationship with, solely with a camera, as, as sort of Johnny was expressing, and the sort of, sort of more constructed reality television format that you know, other vloggers uh, like Johnny are, are, are creating as well. Um, what do you think are the biggest differences between sort of a traditional documentary audience and uh, a vlogging audience? And also, what are the biggest misconceptions that that maybe older documentary audience has? Uh, we've touched on narcissism. We've touched on uh, the idea that, you know, the feedback is, is quite odd. You made a program. Why would you do that? So I think one of the things that's really easy to forget is you... Um, as, as a sort of an outsider to vlogging, you might view one video and discover a talent who, or a vlogger who has a million subscribers, for example. And I think it's, it's too easy to forget that they could have been going for certainly five years on a curve that the first four years of that had almost no audience of subscribers and had to really keep at it and go on. And I think there's a misconception that overnight success just happens. There is an absolute... Uh, work ethic and relationship with that audience that, that needs to, to build. And I think actually telly sort of makes that mistake quite a lot where suddenly they think they can, um, we think we can come in and just replicate that and bring this audience or, you know, mm. see, like, so in the little clip we showed, KSI, um, who's a gaming uh, vlogger, he mentioned he had, uh, you know, gets 100 million views a month. Mm. If you're a TV commissioner, either with a telly channel or a, uh, even an online telly platform, that is absolutely amazing. And you Do want you explain what a gaming vlogger is just to older members of the audience who might not understand? Because it's actually him playing video uh, games and commentating while he's playing them. Yes, and it actually it's a really, uh, it's a mainly, mainly a male audience, um, certainly an 18 to 24 um, focused uh, audience. And some of the biggest vloggers in the world, their primary content is I'm playing. Grand Theft Auto 5, and I'm going to talk you through every different level of it. And for people that are into gaming, partly they're interested in the gaming and partly they're interested in the, the personalities of, mm. of that. But there is sort of a... The personality is a massive part of that. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here, everyone on this panel is in a couple of percent of the biggest vloggers mm. in the world. You sort of forget that there's a 95% level where you are just making those videos for 10 people watching at a time. You're starting that journey and personality is a, a massive part of it. You know, we work with gaming vloggers and comedy vloggers or food vloggers or you know, beauty is obviously a, a massive thing where traditional telly is coming in and, and trying to say, right, we want to take someone that's doing uh, how to get Kim Kardashian's particular look and turn <laughs> that into you know, a half hour or an hour long TV show and, and just actually a lot of the time it really doesn't work. I think we've seen examples where uh, so uh, Zoella, who I guess people will probably know, who's one of the, the biggest vloggers uh, in the UK, featured on Bake Off, and actually it probably added um, some viewers to, to that audience, but what it did was bring a, a young audience that, that wouldn't watch um, telly. Not an enormous one, but it certainly bring a, brought a younger audience to it. And I think with, with the doc um, we made, I think there was some people would have expected that, right, it's got 10 of the world's biggest vloggers into it. This is going to be the highest rated TV show on BBC Three. Actually, what happened when it went out was uh, it probably rated below average for mm. BBC Three because none of the audience really watch yeah. telly in that sort of sense. But um, the talent all tweeted, so the talent tweeted about it. Um, what I thought was really interesting was um, one third of the entire audience watching the show tweeted about it and it created a bit of a bubble around it so that the repeat that was on at midnight absolutely killed it. It was, it was amazing. But then on iPlayer, the next day, it was the third most watched show on iPlayer amazing. at a time. You know, there was only things like EastEnders that were, were bigger yeah. than this because suddenly it was a platform that uh, that viewership was used to coming to and felt really comfortable coming to and could click a link in a tweet to get to mm -hmm. iPlayer or whatever. And also it was really interesting that someone immediately ripped the show as it went out <laughs> on BBC and it immediately got sort of a million viewers outside yeah. the UK sitting on YouTube because everyone could, you know, it wasn't free for us, but... Because BBC at least I we could, is geo-locked. Exactly, so it got it out there immediately. But I think it sort of comes back to there's that 
slight misconception that if you don't respect what a vlogger is good at and what their relationship with their audience is and you think you can just pick them up and plonk them into a tele format, mm -hmm. most of the time that's just not going to work at all. You have to think you have to be really respectful for, uh, to what their audience cares about and that sort of relationship and bring it really carefully into a, a TV space. Totally. But even like... Sorry, can no, I... No, please, um, yeah. Like, the way that um, people, like, their consuming habits has completely changed. So, like, when I was younger and growing up, I'd come back home from school and I would know exactly what time different shows were on that I wanted to watch on TV, and I would tune in at that time to watch it. And now, like, you don't have to watch things live. There's, like, really no incentive to watch stuff live because you can watch it online afterwards and, like... YouTube videos, like you kind of know, like if you've got like six o'clock, there's going to be a new Sakoni Jolly video up. Um, but then, like you, you still have it's still going to be there if mm. you're not there at six o'clock. Like it's still going to be there. You don't. But you should watch it at six o'clock. Okay, <laughs> they're dedicated. <laughs> they're there. Um, but because I, I did a, a TV pilot with ITV2, and you know it got like maybe average or below average on when it aired. But then on ITV Player, or ITV Hub now is it called? I don't know. Um, afterwards, that's where most of the views were because, like you said, you know, just clicking on a link is a lot easier. But yeah, it's that transition, like people don't want to tune in mm. live. I think it's part like attention span, right? Like Snapchat. Also adverts, ugh. Yeah. But like Snapchat <laughs> is like ridiculous. Like you'll get three or 400,000 views for a seven second quick little like, hello. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what, and then people watch Snapchat, like my wife, Anna, she sits in bed for hours just watching Snapchat stories. I'm like, calm down, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's like, it's, it's even quicker than YouTube, you know, like, you know, and it's even quicker than Vine. It's like, I don't know what the next thing is. It's going to be like one second and we're all going to be confused as to why this is so popular. You know? Is it about dwindling attention span? Is it about the fact that I people think it's like feel like they have well, Because podcasts are huge. Mm. They're, you can have like hour and a half podcasts, but then you can, they're kind of like mm. background noise sometimes. Johnny, what do you think, you, you're now working as a TV producer as well. I mean, what, what do you think the biggest misconceptions television has about utilising the, you know, extreme success of this medium and sort of trying to transfer it onto a sort of linear, you know, platform like television? Well, I've noticed, um, kind of talking to, uh, not that I do much of it, but talking to sort of broadcasters and, thing, and things, they're, they're really open to it, actually, and um, U, U, UGC, user-generated content, they're, they're really interested, actually, in featuring it in their programs. Uh, that's something that I've noticed in the last sort of year. Mm. I don't know if anyone else has. Um, and even things like, you know, um, uh, at Postcard Productions, they do a lot of films for things like charities, and charities as well, and organisations... Uh, want this user-generated content, you know, because it's just so easy, mm. you know, and, it, and, and it's so m much more real than, than having, you know, camera crew come around and the lights and the setup and the, it's just, you know, people switching the camera on and just, you know, doing their film, sending you the content, and then you, you edit, all, edit it all together. It's really quick and, and cheap and easy, and actually, I do think people are becoming more open to it, mm. to be honest. Um, but I'm, I suppose from a broadcaster's point of view or a commissioning editor's point of view, what are they getting wrong? What are they not understanding about, oh, we can just, as, as you said, take a talent, put them in a, a television format and it will work. What, what sort of advice would you have to the copious professionals out here who are scribbling down, oh my God, we've got to make sure we get them in it and that's how we can get next show commissioned. What, what are they getting wrong? What, what, how, what could they learn from the experience of actually making those videos and having that audience? Well, I guess it's making sure that... that the talent matches, say, the, the program or the documentary that, that you're going to produce. So I've seen, for example, um, you know, BBC Three documentaries where they have um, YouTube vloggers that uh, maybe don't match up to, say, the mm. subject. Um, very, very much unlike, you know, Jim Chapman was absolutely perfect because he's a super vlogger, so he was absolutely perfect for superstar vloggers. But then I've seen vloggers that kind of uh, put in programs that they just don't match, and it just kind of... What works best, uh, not that I'm an expert, but what seems to work best in, in documentaries is when there's a personal connection and, you know, the, the presenter can obviously talk about their own experience and, and it just flows more naturally. But I've seen, I have seen documentaries where those mm. vloggers, um, you know, they, they don't have a personal connection and that you, that you can see that and it's just, it's just for the name or it's just for kind of mm. the, 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 how much, how many subscri subscribers or viewers they have and, and yeah, maybe that's not... Talking about, talking about numbers of subscribers and viewers, um, you know, this has obviously become a space that has huge commercial 
resonance for brands who were held up uh, by quite restrictive um, issues, particularly Zoella, I know, and Alcatine got in some trouble around fast food uh, and the ways that the, uh, you know, quite naturally, these huge brands who feel that they've got an overregulated space on broadcast are now trying to push their products, uh, you know, through online channels. Um, you've got quite a lot of commercial relationships. What's been the learning experience, you know, for anyone out there, like, you know, good things, bad things that you've learned about working with commercial Yeah, I am... I think one of the, I don't know if we're sharing bad stories, the worst one we ever did was that um, SodaStream came to us um, about two years ago and we made a video and at the same time there was a problem somewhere in the world and they were involved in financing that problem. And the thing about YouTube is that my audience is so large that the people that the problem talking around, <laughs> mm. but the people that but you're the talking about Israel's work yeah. in the occupied territories in Palestine. Yeah, I was trying not to yes. be specific. Well, let's be specific. Yeah, yeah. No. So then we were, and then suddenly I'm sitting here and I'm involved in a brand that is doing this to my viewers, and I'm yeah. like, I'm just making a stupid sparkly drink, you know? And that's how you did. And then that kind of woke me up to the fact that like, oh, right, okay. So with a large audience, you know comes great responsibility. Great responsibility, yeah. yeah and it does, yeah. you know, and you got to feel that like, mm. okay, so, you know, when we're, you know, I work with Glean Futures and we make sure that every brand that comes in, every deal that comes in, we look at like detrimental effect, you know, long-term effect. If I expose myself and align myself with this brand, how is this affecting them, you know, involved in what I want to do over the next five years? Because the internet doesn't forget, you know, the internet, when, when you oh, put they them... Dig. Yeah. Yeah, they dig and they remember, you know, and, and that's why you've got to make sure. So I think a lot of talent now um, will kind of know what brands work and what not brands work. And also, you know, if I have a large 13 to 17 year old audience, I'm not selling them alcohol, even though it might be a good budget. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to damage my, my user base that I've spent six years, you know, begging everybody to subscribe. You know, I'm not going to ruin that for a paycheck. Hmm. Hannah? Um, yeah, I've worked with a few brands, um, and for me, it's kind of like, um, like making content that I would probably already make and that like really suits um, my style of videos and stuff. So I've worked with Durex and Bodyform, and it's very rarely uh, like here's some sanitary towels, like buy the sanitary towels. Um, like I've Although that would be good. That, they would love that. But um, because what they're doing is that they're, they're paying for the eyeballs of your audience. And they're paying for, not just for that one video, but they're paying for those years that you've spent building up a relationship with your audience where they trust you. Um, and so that when you come to sell them something, they, they trust your judgment on it. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not just the one video they're paying for. Like they're paying for all of like the legwork that you've put in previously, mm -hmm. um, with that trust that's there. And um, it's it's about like the one thing that I've found that brands are getting better at now, like understanding the digital space and how YouTubers' relationship with their audience works, is that they're kind of letting go of some of that creative control. Um, so like with adverts. The, the client and the, the brand can be like, okay, it has to be like this, this, and this, and then the actor says this, this, and this. But we're not actors and it's not an advertisement. Um, if they gave us a script, then actually like legally, that video would then be an advertisement rather than like a video that's in partnership or like collaborating yeah. with the brand. And so usually how it works is they're like, these are the key messages. Um, the theme is, so like with the, one with body form, it was about, they wanted to promote these emojis um, that were like period kind of emojis. There was like one that was like bloody knickers and I just thought it was hilarious. Um, and they were just like, just make a video about periods or whatever. And that's something that I would do anyway. And I hadn't made a video about periods before. So I like talk about the first time I got my period and like period taboos and stuff like that. Um, and then like hitting the key messages of like, what the emojis are and where you download them. But ultimately, the, co the main content of the video, like the actual video about periods, like I wrote that, I filmed it, I edited yeah. it. I mean, I suppose some people might argue that that was a loophole that the brands were exploiting for that entire reason. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> good, okay. Um, Princess Shaw, what was your relationship like with sort of like commercial sponsors or with yeah. those? No, I mean, and with, with the music industry, did you find that it was a sort of a different relationship post this sort of, you know, film going mm -hmm. out and? Um, 
I think it changes the way people see you mm. and the way they perceive you. And I think people put too much, I guess they put too much pressure on you as a, I guess, a, a vlogger. Mm. Like, you know, you, it's like you have a lot of responsibility. Because if you like, if you like, show, tell them that this is something I do and you like um, advertise for a company or something and it fails, they attack you. And they don't go for the people with it because you yeah. told them that instead of them, you know. I just think it's a lot of. I don't really have commercials. I don't really care about all that. Really, mm. not really. I just get on my channel and sing and talk. Mm. But yeah, I think it, it's like you have a, a grand responsibility. It's like everything is like about what you tell them, and people seem to follow. They don't really. Some people don't really use their brain. Yeah. They kind of just follow instead of using their brain and research research for yourself. You, it's like you put too much responsibility on the, the YouTubers, and if they say something that's not right, you know, you say people dig, they will dig down to the bottom and they will put up videos and blast you. And it's just like, I think people should use their brain a little bit more. Mm. What do you think the biggest kind of mistakes that YouTubers are making? What, there is a certain naivety, isn't there, about sort of some of the, you know, we talk about the political implications about working with a company like SodaStream, uh, or, you know, some of the sort of more highly uh, documented quite large financial deals being done with individuals who maybe don't have the representation or haven't looked into these issues more thoroughly. I mean, in making your documentary, did you find anything that you know, seemed to be cropping up again and again? So I guess there's a couple of things. One is it's easy to forget uh, how many quite big bloggers are maybe 18, yeah. 17, 19. And when I think back to all the things I did at, at that age, if 10 million people have been watching me, me <laughs> Do them. And you, you sort of, so I've got a little bit of sympathy for, for really uh, young bloggers. I think it is really important to get some decent representation pretty early on, and that there's plenty of people out there that want to represent bloggers now, so there's no uh, oh, yeah. issue with that. But, but actually, I think most vloggers and most, um, most of their reps actually really appreciate the um, more rules and regulations that are coming in, because ultimately it does protect uh, them. But also, it's, it's a really new industry that so many people are trying to find their, their way in. And actually, you know, we've worked with brands and vloggers for years and years, and then we try to, to sort of push away brands that just came and said, look, we just don't care who the vlogger is, but they just mm. need to have a million subscribers, and we want them to hold up this product away, and we just got rid of that. But actually, there's a lot of brands now, and I think they are, brands are ahead of TV because TV's already got a platform. Brands don't have a platform a lot, mm. a lot of the time to have editorial content, so they do need talent that have an audience. But they're, they're much more open to us saying uh, an authentic experience, like being able to fund a video that someone like Hannah might have made anyway, or giving someone an experience that goes up to the next level that they would never have done, or access to something interesting. Mm. That audience is gonna relate to that much better, and you're suddenly gonna have a brand ambassador uh, for you. That, but don't just come and say, can we have, yeah, someone holding up this has nothing to do with it. I think that's exactly what you're saying. It's got to be sort of more fancy. Is there a danger, though, that because the sums involved are astronomical, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds at times, that actually the relationship is inverting as a result of the fact that huge money is being put in, and actually, to an extent, it's the tail wagging the dog now, and actually bloggers are starting to change so that they appeal to brands quite specifically? Can I say something on that? So on, on, that, on, on that, right, so I spend a lot of time talking to brands. I do a lot of conferences where I'm just talking directly to brands. And in saying that, if you offered me an obscene amount of money and I started to change my show to fit the format of the brand to make the money, I lose the audience, it's over. You know, and that, that's the risk that no YouTuber, okay, I'm not going to say no YouTuber, because of course, you know, and I always say, like, I have to sell out a little bit, you know what I mean? I got a mortgage to pay, I got kids to go to school, I got to sell out just a little bit, and I explain that to my audience, and that's why I like this new ruling of disclaiming, where I'll say in a video, I'm like, look, you know, bing, I'll put a little thing and say, look, this is an ad, you know, but... I've got, I've got bills to pay like everybody else. I've got kids to put in school, and, but I'm, I'm acknowledging it, I'm accepting it, and I'm telling people, and you know, and just, and then you'll go and deliver maybe a, a message or a piece of content, and as long as like, I'll always say to a brand, as long as the brand adds value to the experience. So if you watch Sicconi mm -hmm. Jolie's, and Sicconi Jolie's is sponsored by this microphone, provided we come up with a creative solution where the viewer has engage with the microphone, it's added value to their show, then they walk away from it thinking, the microphone and me 
is a good partnership. Mm. If I feel like I've, you know what I mean, please stand by for the commercial. Mm. <laughs> Sure. You know, then you won't feel like. <laughs> I suppose, though, the difference between, say, the relationship that Hannah has with her audience uh, and the relationship Johnny has with a very, very personal experience is that you are part of a team and you're working with young children who haven't expressly said, I'd, I'd like to be part of that. Um, my best friend, who I make my television show with, Hayden Prowse, he was actually in the Secret Garden when he was a kid, he was the boy in the wheelchair. And then we made a TV show. And he got absolutely <laughs> ripped as a teenager. I mean, he was destroyed as a result of a hugely successful, oh, well constructed film. Like, no, 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 no. He was not ripped. <laughs> not actually ripped apart. You know, but he was teased mercilessly um, and it was very difficult. When your daughter becomes an adolescent, if she said, uh, I want you to delete all of this film of yeah. me, um, because you have these commercial uh, relationships, would that affect your decision? No. A lot of the commercial relationships... So you would just we, delete it all? Well, a lot of the relationships you do, obviously you're contracted to keep the content on the platform for a certain duration, but it never is going to exceed duration of my children, you know? Well, a lot of the deals are in perpetuity, aren't they, for the internet? No comment. Right, okay. But, but in the same, all right, so, like, my kids are going to grow up, of course. They're going to hate me when they get teenagers anyway, you know? But all we do is that we make sure that they're aware of what they're, what's going on, what's happening. You know, like we, we travel the world to new conferences, they don't come. Mm. They never come to conferences, they never come to meetups, they never meet our viewers. Well, they do sometimes when we're in the streets and people come up to us, but they're living like a normal life. And I am being very responsible and knowing that like, we're not gonna show them like having a temper tantrum, even though children are a nightmare. But you know, when you watch the show, you're not gonna see that anything that I feel like okay, in the future, this might be something that Emilia might not want to see, then it gets cut out of the show. Because mm. I started this journey um, six years ago. For four of those years, it was just me, and Anna was in it sometimes, and now the kids are in it, and then we might continue to do that, and they'll be out of it again. Sure. You know? I, think, I, mean, I think some people's argument would simply be that a three-year-old child might not be conscious of those decisions on a cognizant level that an adult may. And that's why, um, as their guardian, it's my job of to make course, sure that sure. nothing out there is yeah. seen that could be bad. And, and it's important to say you are by no means the only family. There are some hugely successful American mm. families who have you know, We're vastly... The best, though, let's be honest. You're the best, though, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, we've got, some, we've got 20 minutes for questions, so I'm, I'm sure we're going to have a lively Q&A. Um, if we could have a microphone on either side, uh, I want to take uh, a couple of questions, two or three questions at once. Please ask questions rather than making statements. Um, Sheffield Dockfest is, is known for some pretty good Q&A. So who would like to start? Okay, so down there in the back, and then we'll have you, madam. Um, so could you see that? Gentlemen, could you just raise your hand, please, again at the back? Thank you very much. And then we'll have you, sir. Um, and then we'll have you, yes, sir. So, yes. Hi, all. That was really, really interesting for someone who's now in their 40s and feels a bit out of... Sorry, the microphone's just gone. Can we, can we sort the microphone out? Well, you can, I can repeat the question, so go on, please, please continue. I'll shout. Oh, here you go. Oh, um, here we go. When I, when I look on YouTube comments section uh, of videos, um, it can very, sometimes it can absolutely restore my faith in humanity with comments and a strong sense of community from around the world. And then directly underneath that, there'll be some kind of troll comment, <laughs> um, which makes me throw my hands up in despair. So I just wanna, do you sort of read your comments and respond to them and so on? Because if I was doing what you do, I, I, I would be the sort of person who would probably get too hung up on that. Okay. Um, so the question is, do you, do you read your comments and do you, do you feed back on them? Yeah, the yeah, question? yeah. And, and how do you deal with it? Okay. Of, because there's a lot of people out there who like to take a shot at right. people, especially successful people. Okay, so if you read your comments and feed back on them. Okay, and the second question from Madam, you, you here in the front. I'm going to take two at a time so we can sort of bounce around and have a lot of, a lot of questions. So, the, the lady at the front here, just uh, at the front. Okay, yes, you can. I'm just yeah. like everyone else to be able to hear what you're saying as well. Well, coded question, but I noticed in your early chats, all of the, well, two of you in particular were talking about... Sorry, can we just have a microphone? We are recording this. Uh, uh, to what extent do some, did some of you begin vlogging as a way of telling your own story to yourself, rather than 
rather than explicitly addressing collateral. Okay, so two questions which can kind of combine. So the first one being, you know, do you have a relationship with your comments and how do you feed back on them? And the second being, were you actually telling your stories, I guess as a type of therapy to sort of like understand yourself and feedback rather than directly as a kind of performance? So why don't we yeah. start with, with you, John? Well, first of all, on the comments, I mean, um, I do tell, you know, when I'm doing blogging workshops for people with mental health issues, I make the point that you can turn off the comments and you can turn off the ratings as well because you have YouTube ratings, you know, if you like or dislike them. And that's important because, God, there's, there's some really nasty trolls out there. Mm. I mean, I was trolled uh, a couple of years ago, and it was just in, um, insist persistent, persistent. And um, actually, interestingly, he apologized. The troll apologized, which is, I think is quite rare. Very rare. I know. A, f a few months later, um, he apologized, and he said, look, I'm sorry. Um, I was jealous. Uh, you were doing really well at that point in, in your mental health, and I was struggling with my mental health, and I saw that, and I hated you, so I told you. That's so interesting, Amazing. so rare to get an apology, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's tough, it's, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Um, you know, I know people that have had just the most horrendous abuse, you know, um, someone that was vlogging was constantly being called a paedophile, and, she, and you know, she, it, it absolutely turned her off, and she yeah. went backwards, and so it can really affect. Um, but then for all the negative ones, I mean, you have, as you said, some, some of the most incredible communities, so some really positive, um, lovely comments mm. as well. Um, in terms of the uh, telling, telling story, yeah, absolutely. Mine was, you know, um, it's like, uh, w growing up as a teenager, I used to write a diary and get all my thoughts out that way. Now, I actually turn on the camera and get all my thoughts out, out that way. And um, it's just, you know, um, as I said before, you know, when you talk to someone, it's, you know, you have a, it's not, it's a, it's a conversation with yourself and it's um, uninterrupted and you can just, you can talk for however long you want and, and then the beauty of vlogging, I suppose, is you can edit it afterwards, you know, because I ramble, like I can ramble for like an hour, um, but then, you know, the beauty is you can just edit that down. Um, so it is a form of therapy, actually, and I'm, actually, you know what, I'm more honest in my vlogs than I am with my therapist or my psychiatrist. <laughs> Seriously, I am, because I know I'm not going to be judged and I know, um, I can just say whatever I want, and um, that's okay. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's therapeutic, actually. Yeah, I think, let's say like 95% of my viewers watch because they love me, and then 4% watch because they hate me, and then there's that 1% that are really scary, you know? And, you know, <laughs> most, most people, they do like video, you know, but then some people just say stuff. We, we, we're probably one of the most trolled channels on the internet, you know, because I, I let people into my life so much and they just, they just take apart everything you do. But again, when I have those real conversations with real viewers and I see how much of an impact I'm having in their lives, that completely outweighs people saying stupid things to me. And sometimes we're human, you know, let's say there's a thousand comments and 999 of them are positive and one of them is mean. All you think about is the mm. one. You're like, why did you say that? <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know what that is, you know? Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Hannah? Um, yeah, you ha always have like a love-hate relationship with the comment section, but um, like I said before, like my community are generally like really positive and really su supportive, and so within the first like 24 hours of uploading a video, I will like, I'll read all of the comments and I'll reply to some of them. But then kind of like after that, I don't tend to like look at it again because um, that's when like there might be like the odd person finding your videos who aren't a subscriber and don't necessarily like you. Um, and that's kind of like when the nasty comments can come in. But like over the last five years, I guess it's one of those things where you just grow really thick skin. And um, it's kind of proven from, from your like troll story of the guy that apologized is that... Um, when you see a really trolling horrible comment, so not like some criticism, which could be valid, like a really mean comment, it says more about that person than it does about you. And that's what I always have to remember, is like, this, this comment isn't about me. Like, it, and I, there's like this wall that's up, and I'm like, it's not about me. But then there's the thing like people say like, oh, haters are gonna hate, don't, don't listen to the haters. But then also, like you're saying, like we've got all these people that love us and admire us, but then you also can't listen to them all the time because mm. then you're just going to have this really inflated like, sense of self. Whopping ego. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. needs to be like, brought back down to earth yeah. every now and then. That's um, like the regulation thing, though. I think yeah. regulation's good because I think people need to take, be accountable for what they say mm -hmm. on the internet. We're, we're all accountable, publicly accountable for everything we say. And I think 
people need to be more accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and to respond to the other lady's question, um, I think at the beginning, for me, I was definitely like telling a story to myself because my first videos were, it was, I started making videos just before I went to university and I was a terrible cook and I'm kind of <laughs> still a bit of a terrible cook. Um, but my first videos were me just like teaching myself how to cook and kind of like talking about how I'm such a fussy eater and like trying new foods and then being like, I made spaghetti bolognese for my parents. Um, so that was kind of like just me documenting that and like those videos are like privated now because I'm so embarrassed by them. <laughs> like they're so bad. Um, but yeah, um, it definitely was just like documenting like a personal journey um, and like obviously it's turned into something different now and I occasionally go back and do like a weird food video but <laughs> yeah. Princess Shaw? Yeah, I, I respond to um, comments, all my comments. And if I can't, sometimes so many you can't respond and just do like a video for everybody. But I think in this lifetime, you have the good and you have the bad. So you know that there's good, you know that there's gonna come some bad people. And you know, like you can, it's like you can see, a, somebody can see a rose and they still pick the rose apart. It, they don't see the beauty in things they have to see. They have to find something to rip you apart. And I think that, I just laugh at them like, whatever. Like, you know, I don't even, it doesn't bother me. And the second comment is when I started to, I think everybody, when you start to do your channel, you kind of fall into this thing. It's like you don't really know where it's going. You just do something and just end up going that way. So when I first started my channel, it was to purge myself. Because I, I was like trying to, not, try not to face my demons. And I, had, I was like purging myself. And then it slowly turned into therapy for me. And I began to sing, and singing is therapy for me. And then I began to talk. And then it's like, I didn't think, like I said, I didn't think behind my phone, I just would record. But in this lifetime, you gotta realize, with good, there comes bad. Mm. And you can do this, like, some, I had a song on there, and people just, I mean, they picked me apart, you hear me? Horrible, and I was just like, ha, 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 it's funny to be <laughs> like, I don't really care, so yeah. Mm. Dan, I'm not even gonna ask you about TV producers responding to comments. Um, should we, because uh, we've got... Well, I mean, the only thing I'd say about that is, yeah, as a producer, um, we make loads of content that goes on YouTube or uh, content that goes out on TV that then I read the tweets about and fucking hell, I just yeah. always wish I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And Same. that is, you know, I, no one can tell that I've made that a lot mm. of the time, so my face isn't there, but I'd still take it really personally. There was this brilliant, uh, brilliant quote that Daniel Radcliffe uh, made on a Mark Marin uh, WTF podcast where he said... Uh, why would you Google yourself? <laughs> you're literally going into a whole room of people who literally just want to tell you you're shit. Yeah. Uh, which kind of, There's I think, this, sums up. Sort of There's a lot this of website as well that is like this forum where people bitch about YouTubers. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, and that's kind of like this known thing in the YouTube community. It's like, don't mm. Google yourself mm. on that platform. Like, don't do it. Okay, so we haven't, got, we haven't got that much <laughs> time left. So I want to take three questions this time. Okay, it's good, everyone's going up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rattle through these answers so we can get as many questions as possible. So madam over there, uh, sir, you, and uh, um, the lady there, Grace, in the, in, in, uh, over there at the back. So if we just have quick questions and then we'll come together. I'm sorry, madam, if you, you will come to you next. Hi, so when you first started, how um, much into the future did you think about the ramifications, for example? I think the internet is still relatively quite a, a new development. So all the things that you're putting up now, do you worry that in 10, 20, 15 years time, if you want to change your mind, all the content is up there? Mm. Do you ever worry about the fact that you might have overshared and it's something that you, you've crossed the line of no return? Okay, so we're talking about over ramifications, the internet never forgets, and you know, would you, would you, how far ahead are you the impact that it might have on your future family. Yeah, future family, for instance. You, sir? Um, hi. <clears throat> I was just wondering if you could, if the panel could explain somehow how monetization works. Okay. Um, there seems to be very little on YouTube when you Google for that. Right. Okay. So we're talking about monetization of YouTube and uh, uh, Grace at the back. Um, mine is a question for Dan and sort of for everyone, but I wondered if, uh, from a TV producing point of view, if you saw a difference between working with people who create their own content um, in comparison to people who you're used to sort of directing. Was there a difference in the way that they work? Are they harder to direct? Um, and for the panel, is there an appetite for you guys to be on telly or are you very happy 
doing what you're doing just online. Okay, so we'll, talk, we'll talk, take the three questions. I'm not going to open them up to everyone because I want to come back to the audience, so please get your questions ready again. Um, so the first question, the ramifications of the internet and putting stuff up. Uh, Prince Sean, when you started making your, your, your music, did you feel at all like that? Um, I kind of feel like it is what it is. I'm a person just like you. And, and maybe in the beginning I was kind of like, oh my God, that's not a good video. But after that, it was like, you know, it's life and we all go through struggles and, I mean, it's life. So I didn't really like, now it's like, I'm, I'm in a whole documentary, so now everything's out there. So now I'm just like, you know, I just take it as it is and just like, relax. Mm. Johnny, I mean, obviously your relationship with your children, you and your wife must have had conversations about this. Not really, she trusts me. But I did start mm. YouTube when I was 30. And I feel that, like, I was an idiot in my 20s. Thankfully, YouTube wasn't around and I, no one listened to me. So I feel like I got into it more mature, kind of, sort of. So most of the decisions that I've made, most of the content I've put out there, I kind of have an adult perspective on it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's okay. Johnny? Um, sorry, my mind's just gone back. Sorry. We're just talking about sort of, do, you know, oversharing the ramifications. Do you ever think, oh, I'll look back on this in 10 years' time? Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um... Yeah, when I first started YouTube, um, I, didn't, I did it under another name because I wasn't yet out, both in terms of my mental health, also being gay and gay as well. And I, I came out on YouTube and, you know, all, and then a um, family friend of ours somehow found my YouTube channel and he called my parents up and said, you know, Johnny's put all his stuff on YouTube. And my mum and dad watched it and things that I'd never said, said to them, wow. they saw. And I was like, right, I'm deleting this. I'm never going back onto it. But... Then I said to myself, you know what, this is helping people, and I know mm. it's made a difference, so no, I'm going to keep okay. going. And, and uh, you know, I, I share, yeah, I share pretty much mm. everything, and sometimes I do think, Johnny, you know, what are you doing? Like, hold some stuff back. Um, but then I think, no, because, as I said, I, the whole point of what I'm doing is to help other people. And, sure. You know, I, I suffered in silence for so long, and I don't want anyone else to go through that. Mm. So, um, and in terms of actually, just to answer your question about, I think for me, because... Uh, the way I got into TV, actually, I was approached by a production company to do a, to present a BBC Three documentary on, on mental health, and um, I was like, yeah, because if it's something I'm passionate about, and in mental health, I'm so passionate about, and, and breaking the stigma and um, improving things, so absolutely. But obviously, if it was um, a documentary about football, well, no chance. Um, but no, I mean, you know, if those opportunities come along, you know, there's lots of documentaries I want to do mm. around mental health. There's so much to cover. Um, so absolutely, I will. I think, yeah, I think it can work. Absolutely. If okay. So many, sorry. So we've got just because we've got limited yeah. time. Hannah. Um, I think about that all the time. Um, I'm like, if I have children in the future, will they hate me? <laughs> will they just be really embarrassed and not? And I don't know. Um, when I started, I definitely didn't think where it was going or about like ramifications of it at all. Um, now I definitely think about it a lot more. Um, like, there's videos of me drunk on the internet. Mm. They're kind of just there forever. But I still stand by that. I'm, like, really proud of my YouTube channel. And I think that it has helped a lot of people and it does a lot of good. And um, breaking down, like, the stigma around talking about sex and relationships and sexuality and all of that stuff. Um, so I may do the odd idiotic thing. But ultimately, I think, like, it's good. Mm. Monetization. We're going to talk about really quickly, just because we got, um, uh, I've got a, a weird Dalekly red light flashing at me. Um, but uh, I mean, it, it's fair to say I think we'd all agree that the more subscribers, the more followers you have, the more you can monetize your relationships, bring your eyeballs. Is that sort of the, the normal will, thing? Won't really have an impact. Right. It's your views. It's your views. Yeah. Yeah. Engagement. Mm. You know, your ability to drive an audience, convert it to sales. Yeah. That's so just so you understand, engagement rate is generally uh, uh, the sharing rate that the video is viewed to the amount it's shared is an analytic. Um, and that is, 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 is something that's highly used. So the question about uh, TV talent that came directly to you, um, have you found it different working with people who, uh, I mean, certainly when I started working in TV, I thought I, could, I should do everything myself because that's what we've done online. Yeah, so I guess it's two parts. So one, I think it's really important to respect um, what a creator, an online talent, what their relationship with their audience is and that they know exactly what, you know, they've tried for five years to work out exactly what their audience does and doesn't like. And if we tried to put words in their mouth that they wouldn't say, uh, and that's a co constant conversation I have to have with brands of, there's no point in giving them this script that just sounds ridiculous, just let them say it how they want it. Um, making things like the, the doc, the, and other content that we make, the immediacy, 
and the time frames is so different in telly and in vlogging. So when we film someone, they say, when's this going out? And so, oh, so we're probably shooting for three more weeks and we'll cut it for two months yeah. and it'll probably go out a month after that. And like, what the fuck? <laughs> I just shot this thing and it's going out tomorrow. <laughs> so that's to get used to it. And then I think I sort of touched on that earlier that the way that um, a documentary producer would spend a lot longer uh, thinking about the sorts of questions they would ask and ask from a different perspective. I was really surprised when all the huge bloggers that we talked to said, no one's ever asked me that, or I've never even asked that of myself, even though they're producing constant content, and a lot of it is about themselves. Asking things from a different perspective actually brings out really interesting stuff, and a lot of them said, and really people said, I've never even talked to my therapist about what I've just said on camera, and yes, you, yes, you can use it. But I've never even talked openly about it because no one had asked them in that sort of way. Right, I'm terribly sorry to end it. I'm sorry, I'm sure these guys will be around later. I just want to thank my panel, if you could give them a round of applause for being so incredibly open with us. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, Sheffield DocVest is really proud that we're starting to bring a new generation of uh, talent from online uh, to a wider audience. Whatever you may feel about the differences uh, between TV uh, and the internet, there's no doubt there's a certain amount of bravery that comes with really sharing some of your closest, the most personal memories or intimate details with them. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, please join us uh, again for our, our, the rest of our panels. There's some amazing events going on later today. And thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.